Good evening. How's everybody tonight? Can you hear me? Here we go. Thank you, Stacy, and good evening. My guest tonight is truly one of the greatest character actors of his generation. Vincent D'Onofrio is the consummate human chameleon who immerses himself in his believable roles, imposing, intense, and eccentric. His career as an actor began on the stage, studying at New York's American Stanislavski Theater and at the Actors Studio. He made his Broadway stage debut in 1984 playing Nick in the play Open Admissions. As a film actor, his career came, his career break came when he played the overweight, mentally unbalanced Marine recruit Private Leonard Gomer Pyle Lawrence in Full Metal Jacket, directed by the renowned Stanley Kubrick. For this role, he transformed himself by shaving his head and gaining 70 pounds. The wide variety of roles he has played and the quality of his work have earned him a reputation as a versatile talent. He was in the box office smash Men in Black as the bad guy Edgar the Bug. Other films of note in which he has appeared are Mystic Pizza, JFK, The Player, Ed Wood, The Cell, and The Breakup. Vincent garnered critical acclaim along with co-star Renee Zellweger for The Whole Wide World, which he helped produce. He also made a guest appearance in the TV series Homicide, Life on the Street, in a 1997 episode where he played an accident victim who could not be rescued and was destined to die. For this performance, he received an Emmy nomination. He both produced and starred in Steal This Movie, a biopic of radical leader Abby Hoffman. He directed and starred in Five Minutes Mr. Wells and directed Don't Go in the Woods. In 2001, he took on the role of a lifetime, Detective Robert Gorin in the beloved TV series, Law and Order, Criminal Intent. In his career, his various film characters have included a priest, a bisexual former porn star, a hijacker, a few serial killers, Orson Welles, a space alien, a 1960s radical leader, a pulp fiction writer, and an ingenious police investigator. His on-screen love interests have included Julia Roberts, Cameron Diaz, Renee Zellweger, Marissa Tomei, Tracy Ullman, Rebecca De Mornay, and Lily Taylor. He recently returned to the New York stage, co-starring opposite his dear friend Ethan Hawke in the new group's production of Clive. Actor, director, producer, writer, musician, and I believe magician. Yes, he can do it all. Please welcome Vincent D'Onofrio. Hi. So welcome, here we are. It's like a shrink session. We got the shrink chairs tonight. So you know, you were born in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, right? And you were raised in Miami. I'm fascinated by magicians. So you got interested in magic and sleight of hand at an early age, didn't you? Yeah, my parents sent me to camp in I think South Carolina or something like that. And um, I was a really introverted kid and I was scared about going to camp. I was scared of bullies and stuff and because uh, I had heard these stories that kids from the South beat Northerners up, you know. <laughs> and so I got very nervous. Um, but I saw this kid on the bus. We were traveling to do some kind of silly camp thing. And uh, I saw this kid on the bus playing with these uh, balls and doing a trick to some other kid. And I, on the way back from the trip, I asked him if I could buy those balls off him and the instructions that came with them. And, uh, and then um, shortly after that, we moved to Florida. And there was a, a wave of entertainers that came over from Cuba. And I, I met about five or six blocks from our house. I met a husband and wife uh, team of magicians. And they took me under their wing. I couldn't afford to buy the magic. So they used to lend me the instructions so I could build them on my own. And I started this little, got this little routine and annoyed my sisters and my mother for a long time. And then uh, they told me that I should do something about it and try and earn some money. And uh, 
So my mother used to work at um, a restaurant called Ranch House in Florida, which is was sort of like Denny's before Denny's. And she was a waitress there, and uh, she knew a lot of uh, police because they used to come in and eat lunch there. And so she asked them if they would come over to the house. We had a pool in our backyard, a little kidney-shaped pool, typical Florida-size, you know, backyard pool. And she had these police come over, and we had Live at Five come over, and I had built this mailbag this, um, from, these, from this book of Houdini's, and the cops handcuffed me and chained, put me in the bag and chained me and pushed me into the pool. <laughs> and they, uh, they filmed it all. And I, I worked constantly after that. Do you have the footage? I don't, I don't think so, no. Gotcha. no. Do you still do magic? Do you do sleight of hand or card tricks? I can do it. Yeah, okay. I can do it. Next time. We'll Not as good, but I used to, I can do it. I gotcha. When did you decide to become an actor? What was that defining moment for you? My sister, Beth, um, my dad was involved in community theater before my, um, um, after my parents got divorced, wherever my dad lived, he would set up a community theater company. And so I would always run lights and, and do sound and stuff like that. But my sister, Beth, went through all like junior high and high school in the drama department. And she, she you know, she was, she was acting all the time in, in school. I never did that, but, um, Eventually, um, she had all the, I noticed that all these girlfriends of hers were kind of cute. And uh, I basically started getting into acting because of that. <laughs> and I, I remember going, I remember going to um, watching these, these guys perform on stage and being, watching, you know, just hanging out, trying to be close to the good-looking girls, and, and, and I remember this guy, one guy, I'll never forget him, I won't say his name, but I still remember his name, and, and uh, I, I remember thinking to myself, you know, I'm not, I could never do that, I'm not as good as him, you know, but if I studied, I bet I could be better than him. I, I bet I could figure it out better than he's figured it out, and that's when it, that I remember that exact moment when that happened, and and my sister and I then decided to um, to seek out the best teacher in New York and uh, figure out some kind of system of acting. So that's when we, um, my father, uh, found out about the Stan American Stanislavski Theater Company, and uh, we ended up going there. But let's talk about this. You came to New York, and you also studied. You also studied at the Actors Studio, right? I, I studied with Sharon Chatton, who's from the Actors Studio. I was never a member of Actors Studio okay. ever, no. But I, but I was there a lot and, and studied under Sharon. So when you went to the American Stanislavski Theater, why that? Out of all the acting schools in New York, why did you choose that one? I think it was because she had written so many books about Stanislavski, and that that um, we really wanted to find a a system of acting, something that we could follow, that something that we could actually, that was written out and that would make sense. You know, not that, because we, my Beth, my, my sister Beth and I, we never really thought of it as something you kind of wing, mm -hmm. because anybody that we'd ever met that winged it was really bad at acting. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so we figured that the best way to do it was to figure out, you know, who, was, who had created the best system of acting. And, at that time, the most books that were written were about Stanislavski. And Sonia Moore was the author of a few of those books. And uh, that's why. OK, I want to talk about some of the, the early years, the early times, the early years in New York, because you worked as a bouncer at Hard Rock Cafe. I worked at a bouncer at a lot of places. I worked at the Mud Club. I worked at Studio 54. I worked at uh, Xenon, I worked at the Ritz, which used to be where Webster Hall is, yeah. 11th Street, 234. I worked at a lot of places. Was it because of your height and your stature you got those jobs? Yeah, and I, and I was a good talker and a decent fighter. Okay. <laughs> well, that'll get you that kind of job. Mm. Um, you also worked as a bodyguard during that time period, and you worked for Yul Brenner? I did. That's when I, I started working for the Hard Rock Cafe, and Rock Brenner, yeah. Yul's son, um, got me a gig working with his dad, 
when uh, for the last time he uh, appeared on Broadway for the King and I. So talk about. But I, 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 I um, but I bodyguarded for a lot of people, not yeah. just him, but just. But he was really special. Talk about working with Yul Brenner, what it was like, and what you learned from him. Well, I mean, I wish I had worked with him as an actor, but not yet, I wasn't even close to that. I mean, I would basically carry his dog for him and, and just watch every movie he made, you know. Uh, the most interesting thing that I think I learned was the perseverance, you know, the, the total commitment that he had I mean, I, I was, I think, maybe 19 or 20 or 20, I don't know, somewhere between 19 and 22 or something. But I, I'll never forget that he used to come out of his, um, he used to come out of his dressing room, um, you know, and he was, a, he was sh short anyway, but he was even smaller because he was dying. In fact, he died a couple of weeks later. Um, but I remember him. He would be sort of collapsed, and he would have his little dog, and he would bring his dog, and he would walk in these little steps to the to the side of the stage, to and wait for his cue when he would hear the orchestra. And uh, when he felt his cue was coming, he would he would take a deep breath, and expand himself, and wait for his cue, and then he would go out. And then I would watch him. And watch him perform the same stuff, and then when he came off, as soon as the, uh, as soon as the, uh, the lights, uh, when you could watch, I used to watch the, um, him come into the darkness from the light, and as soon as his whole body passed into the darkness of the stage, he would just fold back down again, and he'd walk Uh, unbelievable. It, it was, I'll never forget it. It was like, I, when I talk about it now, it's like it happened yesterday. Thank you for sharing that. In January of 84, you made your Broadway debut in the play Open Admissions. What do you remember about your debut and how exciting was it to be on Broadway for a young actor? It was great. I wish more people had gone to the play, but... <laughs> yeah. One of the things I remember, we were talking about Campbell Scott earlier. I had met Camel Scott many years later from that play. But when I met him, um, what I was doing at that time was I was working as a bouncer at the Ritz and, and, and doing a Broadway show at the same time and studying during the day. So I would study, do the show, get on a train, go all the way downtown to 11th Street to Union Square, get off, work all night, sleep, study, and that's what I would do. And Campbell was one of, I think, the 50 people who saw the show. <laughs> and many years later, he told me that his, his wife, the woman he's still married to, they were dating at the time, and uh, he took her to see the show. And he, you know, he gave me lots of compliments about how wonderful he thought I was. But then, but he said what was weird about it is then they went out to a club afterwards. <laughs> and and I was at the door of the club, <laughs> which I thought was so funny. You know, just... That's great. What did you take away from that experience? Because I think it was 17 performances. I mean, here you are, you make your Broadway debut. It comes and goes so quickly. Was it bittersweet? It was all new to me. You know, I didn't, it didn't affect me in a negative way at all. Yeah. I, I remember just being completely committed to what I was doing as an actor. and. Um, I kind of saw some wishy-washy stuff going on and didn't really think it was going to work anyway. I remember thinking that, that there's a few people that are trying really hard to make it right, but that it just wasn't quite working. And I was having a blast, but I kind of already had registered in my mind, I think, that it wasn't going to be a long thing. And so I just made the best of it, really. And... Uh, it wasn't, no, I, I've been very fortunate that I've never had that kind of bittersweet feeling in, in, this, in this business. I've had success and I've had failure and stuff, but I've never quite felt bitter about it in any way. It's all been, been very kind of sweet in a way. And uh, I, I don't, you know, I, I, think, it, I think it was, it, it, people tried, a few people in that 
company tried really hard to get it going, but it just never had a life. Yeah. So I, mean, I think CCH Pounder was in that too. Oh, she was lovely, yeah. yeah. Great yeah. actress. And she later, many, many years later, I think she did my show. And yeah. Yeah. And so did Kevin. Kevin did my show too, many, many years later. And that was just, that's just, you know, so much fun. Because even as a bouncer and a bodyguard, I bodyguarded Dan Aykroyd and stuff, and later I did a film with him. And, and uh, you know, they, it's hard for people to remember you, so, because the context is so different. <laughs> and so we did Feeling Minnesota. I mean, I used to bodyguard for Dan a lot when he was very successful during Saturday Night Live and stuff, and we just after. And then when on the, he was, uh, he had a, a part of a police sergeant or something on in Feeling, Minnesota, and he came, when he arrived, and I, I walked up to him and I said, Dan, and he was, and I, and I like uh, went to hug him. I, I thought that he would, you know, because we had many, you know, some crazy things. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, when you're a bodyguard in that kind of situation back in the day, back then, when there was no, like, internet or anything, or people with cameras, there was a lot happening. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And so, uh, we had a real bond, and, but because all these years had passed, and I was, you know, one of the main roles in the movie, it was, it was difficult. So I watched him, I looked at him in the eyes, and I said, Dan, and he said, yes. And I said, it's Vincent. And there was this like really long pause. And it was like went on and on. And I watched the whole thing unfold <laughs> in his eyes. You know, and I didn't say a word because I was so curious. I was watching it happen in his eyes. He said, Vinny? And I said, yeah. And he went, fuck. <laughs> He knew you from the back of the limousine or some private club. You know. Well, no, he... <laughs> it all came back. It, it all, it all came back, and yeah. he was, you know, you, this huge smile came over. He was first this shock, and then this huge smile came over his face, and then we were... You know, and then we just hung out for the, for the, whole, the whole shoot. Yeah. And so it, it, it was like that a few times, and, and, and was like that with actors, too, like... With, with these people, with like Kevin that I did the show with, when he was on my show many years later, it's just, you know, when you're in this business for a long time, as you guys know, if, if any of you have been in the business for a long time, there's there's such a um, a warmth between legitimate actors, uh, people that are not jerks, and and that because there's a few of them too, but the ones that aren't. And the ones that have met under the best circumstances where everybody's a committed actor and everybody's a legitimate actor, like these people we've been yeah. talking about, when you meet them later on in life or you meet them continuously through your whole career, there's such a camaraderie, such a, a warmth. You know, I just went and saw Tony Lobianco's uh, show that he's doing about LaGuardia. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there's another guy, you know, I, I went backstage and said hello to him, you know. And I mean, not only is he Italian, so that automatically warms my heart, but, but he's, uh, you know, the guy, I grew up watching the guy in movies, you know. And the idea that he would accept me as a friend and as a peer, even is just so warm and so great. I mean, it's one of the best things about, I, I think, about being an actor who's been doing it for a long time. As you get older, things just get better. You know, It's just amazing how warm this business can really be. You know? Sorry to go on about it. No, but I love just, that. You know, you recently returned to the stage in the new group's production of Clive, co-starring your dear friend Ethan Hawke. What was it like returning back to the stage and doing that show? Well, I, I don't think of myself as a stage actor. You know, I don't, I just don't. You know, I, I, I wish I could say I did, but I don't. Um, I told you earlier, you know, I grew up watching so many incredible performances on stage by so many incredible stage actors. 
And I've been in situations, you know, where I've seen some of the best performances ever that will ever be of that particular character and that particular actor. I've been lucky enough, as, as a lot of us have been, to see performances, you know, I was saying like Daniel Day-Lewis doing Hamlet at the National, and I saw, I saw Campbell Scott do Hamlet in California, uh, by, uh, with Jack O'Brien directed it. I mean, it's just, the, you know, one of the best Hamlets ever. And, and Daniel's was one of the best Hamlets ever. I mean, I just, um, I, I'm not that. That's, you know, so uh, I, I consider myself a film actor But you know you have these friends who want you to come in and do things with them, you know, and uh, they ask you, you know, will you do this, you know, and they send you a script and it's like, <laughs> you know, it's an adaptation of a Berktal Breck play called Ball, which nobody ever read about, read or <laughs> seen, and uh, or most mostly nobody and. It's funny though, but when you do it, everybody comes out of the woodwork and is suddenly a Brecht, you know, yeah. aficionado. A Brechtian. Yeah, which is also weird. But, um, uh, and so I read it and he, he said, will you play Doc in, in this thing? And, and I read it and the first thing that came through my mind is absolutely not, I will not play Doc, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and there was all these other roles and the cool thing about Clive, which was, was what the play was called, is that, uh, there were many parts for like six, six, six other actors who were going to play multiple roles, and I was like, Jesus, you know, I could play these four guys. You know, I'd love to play these four guys here. You know, I didn't know who he had in mind, or I hadn't been at the casting sessions, but I will not play Doc. You know, but I didn't tell him that, <laughs> and I just thought, you know, Jesus, I'm going to have to do this because Ethan asked me to do it, and. Uh, so I had it all sorted out, but I kept reading the play. I do that a lot. I, I read the scripts that I'm, I know that I'm going to be involved with. I read them a lot. I read them over and over. In fact, I don't stop reading scripts that I do until the last day of shooting or the last. I always, I'm con continuously reading the, the script um, over and over and over again. So as I'm reading, I'm trying, I'm plotting out my presentation to Ethan. <laughs> of these characters that I want to play. So I picked like four of them. And as I was doing a film in Los Angeles at the time, and as I was reading them, I got, I fell in love with the character of Doc. <laughs> and and I it suddenly figured out how to play Doc. And, and so I was able to, you know, get on my iPad and write him this wonderful email, absolutely I'll play Doc, and, <laughs> uh, you know. Uh, but it didn't come easy. And then, and then I showed up at the new group, which is this great little nonprofit theater, which I loved everybody there. And I, we, we had a great ensemble, and Ethan playing the role of Clive and directing. We did like six weeks of rehearsal, maybe five weeks of rehearsal, and it was just fantastic. I, it, it just seemed so natural, and everybody just kind of, their roles just kind of happened over a five-week period, were developed, and... Uh, um, nobody changed the word of dialogue. There was no. There was. It was. It was so tight. Um, it was nothing like the experience that I had at Tooth the Crime, which was not tight at all. Mm -hmm. And this was completely tight and completely. Everybody was in it for the, for Ethan and this. This. How can we possibly get away with Ball now? Yeah. You know, or Clive, and so it was a great experience. Um, I have, uh, and I probably won't do another play until Ethan asks me. I mean, I, you know, my the one of the guys from UTA, my agency, uh, a, a few of them came to the play, <laughs> but one of the one of the agents came and he's like, so you know, because I I got this great review in the Times and blah blah blah, and 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 uh, you know, he was so happy and everything, and and I had never met him before, and he was a lovely guy, but. He says, so we, we're set now, we can, I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> have no interest whatsoever. You know. I mean, if somebody like Ethan or somebody like O'Brien or somebody like that asked me to do something, I mean, it would be tough to turn down, but 
I've seen too many, you know, these, these guys, these people, these girls, these, these men, these women that I, were, that I was performing with at Clive were incredible actors. I mean, they were just phenomenal, you know. Put me to shame. You know, they were just so good at what they did. You were terrific in Clive. I, I was okay. Right? But no, well, that's, I'm not fishing for yeah, a compliment. Yeah. It was, it's, it's just as, as a, look, I know I'm a good actor. That's for sure. You know, I, I, don't, I don't have a career for no reason. I have a career. It's certainly not because of my looks or, or because I'm a, like, a, I should have been, like, it was like this toss-up between being, like, a supermodel and a actor, you know? It's, there's, there's, I mean, I'm an actor. I'm successful because I'm a good actor. I get that. But I also know good actors when I see them. And, uh, uh, you know, every night was a thrill. We were talking about Zoe... Uh, Zoe Kazan. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the play, I don't know if any of you saw it, but I end up in heaven wearing these wings on a ladder, basically in the back, looking down at the, the last uh, few pages of the play. And uh, every night Zoe would come out, and there was a line, uh, there's a rat dying in the gutter, so what, right? Just that line. And every night, that woman would perform that line differently every night. Like she was so brave that she would come out there and every night completely committed to a brand new way of saying that line or feeling something and having the line just come through what she was feeling rather than, I'm not saying that she would practice the line in a different way. No, she would create this whole new thing every night and so whatever was going on inside her body and I would watch it happen and then the line the author's words would just come through whatever was going on through it and it would be it would land differently every night and some nights it would be completely flat like and that would work and some nights it would be like fuck, like spark that energy spark that moment in the play and that would work too it was just incredible yeah. Anyway, let's move on. That's Clive. Well, I want to talk about living in the moment. And uh, also, wait, I, one more thing. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Because um, he's like a brother to me. Ethan Hawke is, you know, just, he, he, you know, I, I know him so well as a person first. But to be on stage with him every night where there were portions in the play where we just never left the stage for a long period. And uh, we're just you know, spewing out all this crazy emotion and, uh, you know, he's so, he just gives everything he has, that kid. I mean, he's, he's a kid to me. He eats everything he has every night. You know, like a real artist, like a true artist would. You know, it's not, it's far from, you know, theater. It's his, it's guts and spit and blood and just wah, every night. Amazing, amazing. I mean, I was like so impressed. I, you know, so anyway. So I see theater in your near future. I, just from what you're telling us here. I know you don't want to do it, but I think you're going to want to do it again. I hope you're going to want to do it again. Maybe seven, 17 okay. years I'll do it. We'll see. You have an incredible and diverse body of work. You're famous, but you never chased fame, did you? I don't know. I don't know what that means. But I mean, you're someone who always goes after the work. You never went after, you know, being on cover of magazines and doing big, big movies. No, you have to have a paid. press agent for that. Yeah. yeah I, don't, I can't see paying somebody to get people to know about me. I think that's nonsense. But you never wanted that. It was always about the work for you, wasn't it, as an actor? Yeah, I mean, it's always about the work. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely, always about the work. It always has been. It's the why. It's why I can come out here and not feel like a fraud. It's why I can walk out on stage every night and not have butterflies. It's why I can juggle many different things when the camera's rolling. I can, you know, if you think about it in terms of juggling, I can juggle an accent. Uh, Reaction, action, posture, voice. I can juggle five or six balls while the camera's rolling. I completely committed to the work. And I'm never nervous about it. 
and because my, it's where my mind is, that's where my uh, commitment is. Yeah. Well, let's get into your body of work. Everything changed for you when you took on the role of Private Leonard Lawrence in Full Metal Jacket. How many people saw Full Metal Jacket here? <laughs> Brilliant performance. What was your audition like for that and the phone call you got from Mr. Kubrick? Do you remember the phone call? Yeah. That was, uh, I was working at the Hard Rock Cafe and I'm, I'm standing at the door and it's in the afternoon and Matthew Modine and his wife Carrie come walking by and uh, I had known Matthew from class and from some auditions. We practiced lines together for, for some silly teen movie in Central Park once. We got to know each other. We ran lines with each other. And he was walking by and I, I saw, I said, you know, Matthew, what are you up to? And we started to hang out and talk. He said, well, I'm doing this Stanley Kubrick movie. And I was like, wow, cool. And he goes, I don't know what it's, this, the first half of the movie is about, but they're looking for the lead guy for the first half. And he said, you should send a tape. And so he gave me the information. And uh, I was doing a play at some little theater called the Nameless Theater, which used to be on like, I think it was like 22nd between 7th and 8th or 6th and 7th or something like that, where you would do a show and at the end of the show, the pervs were already coming in because there was like an S&M show right after it. <laughs> so, you know, the long trench coats were filing in as you were like finishing your show. Um, so I did a monologue uh, from that play on a stoop on 10th Avenue and, uh, and 40, Third Street, like right around the corner from Actor Studio. And back then, you know, the cameras were like, you know, this fucking big. They were like this. <laughs> and, and you had to carry a deck with a strap. You know, you remember those days, guys? I can see you 50-year-olds out there. <laughs> and uh, so, I, you know, I had to rent all that stuff, you know. So we rented it all. And we shot a, f a couple of takes. And I took it to a buddy of mine at NYU who had some editing equipment and, uh, you know, we cut it. And, and I sent the best one out there. And um, then I didn't hear anything for a few weeks. And, and I was living in Jersey City at the time with some girl. <laughs> and he called. And the phone rang. And he said it was Stanley Kubrick. And I immediately hung up. <laughs> <laughs> because it's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, it's like, why would that happen? <laughs> and so, the, uh, right? So I called back, uh, he called back, and the first thing he said is, uh, please don't hang up. <laughs> and I said, okay, who is this? And he, he said, it's Stanley. And I said, that's very hard to believe. Uh, I thought you were British. He said, no, I'm a Jew from the Bronx. <laughs> and I said, oh, OK. I, you know, I felt really stupid. Um, and he said, I want you to send me another tape. I'm going to send you, I have some, I already sent you some words. You know, I want you to put it on tape for me again, and I want to look at them again. I said, OK, you know, and click. And so I eventually, in a couple of days, I got this envelope of, basically, it was just words, no punctuation, no nothing. And, uh, you know, I didn't have, you know, I rented all this stuff again. And in my backyard, uh, which was basically a fence um, in Jersey City, I stood against the fence and I did this dialogue that he sent and uh, sent it off. And then a couple of weeks later, he called uh, again. This time I didn't hang up. And he said that, uh, I want you to come out here. And uh, I want you to do the part. And uh, he said, you're going to have to you know, gain some weight. And he gave me uh, uh, a book to read, uh, Short Timers. And so I read Short Timers, and I went out there. And... Um, 
we, uh, so I started gaining the weight. It, I got a Warner Brothers credit card and started to just, you know, got a nice little flat in London and, and uh, put on, first I think I put on like 30 pounds or something like that, 30, 40 pounds. And I, I, we were doing monkey patrol with the rifles and learning how to march and all that stuff. And uh, he, he said, this is not working. It just looks like you can kick everybody's ass, you know. And he said, you're going to have to put on more weight. So I ended up putting on 80 pounds in total. Wow. And uh, so I, I went, yeah, I went from like 210 to, from like 2, you know, I was young, so I, like 2 to 280. And, and, uh, and that, that, that did it. That was the right look. And... Um, And then we started, you know, there's a lot of stories about Stanley Kubrick, you know, the, you know, he's, he was quite something else, you know, he was an interesting guy. I, he never spoke about acting, he never spoke about performance, he never spoke about story, never. He would just ask you to, you know, he would just say, what are you going to do? And uh, he would cast who he thought could do it. And uh, you would do it for him, and he would say... Uh, you know, I'm going to put a camera here, a camera here. Don't move over there. Move over there instead. And, and then we would just start shooting. And the only direction he would give when we were working was do it better. You can do better than that. Or do it faster. Or, uh, um, you know, you, you weren't in the light. You missed your light. You know, look at your, you know, mark and hit your mark, you know. Um, that's how he directed, and it was he would really just put the pressure on you, and, and you'd really have to just, you know, I think it, it, I think because he was that way, it, it, it being my first film, you know, he set a standard for me that I've always kind of held, that it was my responsibility, that it, that it was my total responsibility to bring in a character and, and be ready to do it, and ready to do anything the director asked, you know. If the director needed me to do it faster, then I would do it faster, whatever. And um, he set this kind of standard. Um, and then I, I've told this story before. The only thing he said to me was the day before we were going to shoot the uh, the big scene where I kill the sergeant and then kill myself was that uh, he said it had to be uh, big. He said it had to be Lon Chaney big. And uh, and I I was. You know, I was, you know, I was very fortunate that, you know, I was, I was so how I was going to do it. I was going to do it. I had it all set in my mind, and I had, I was discussing it with my teacher Sharon Chatton over the phone. From she was in Los Angeles at the time, and I was in England, and I would call her uh, once every couple of days and talk to her about my plan and how I was going to execute it in that particular scene. Uh, so we went in the next day. We did it in three takes. It was awesome. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that was the whole Full Metal Jacket thing. So was it scary and exciting at the same time? I mean, being thrown into that, your first film? and I mean, there were people way? being fired around me, so it was a little scary at the first, you know. It lasted for a long time. Yeah. So, I mean, I was there for 13 months doing that, and, and, and I'm only in, like, 30 minutes of the film, and I was there for 30. And Matthew's... Uh, first son, Bowman, was conceived and turned a year old before they finished the film. Interesting. Yeah. So I was there uh, for like, you know, 13 months just for that. So, you know, after six months, you're not so nervous anymore. You yeah. Know. Yeah, but I would say the first few months, it was a little nerve wracking because, you know, the guy who was going to play the drill instructor got fired. There was people getting fired around you and there were people being set straight all around you. I mean, I watched one actor go through 72 takes over a two-day period. Yeah, and and with Stanley, uh, but you know, it was the, it was. I have to say that it was not Stanley's issue. It was really, truly the actor's issue. But um, he wasn't the most socially, yeah. you know, uh, graceful person, Stanley. And and it was on a megaphone and. You know, it's t he had this thing, you know, he'd <coughs> go like that all the time, <coughs> before he spoke. And go, ah, ah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's take 71. 
Um, take 70, sucked. <laughs> Let's try again. Oh, that's going to be great for an actor to hear. Yeah, and you're sitting next to him, you know, you're sitting next to him while he's doing this, and you're like, oh, my God, you know. Yeah. I hope that doesn't happen to me, you know. And it didn't. Well, your next film after that was a totally different look you had in Adventures in Babysitting. But yeah. you lost everything, right? I mean, it was, you had one yeah. big scene in the movie, right? Who saw Adventures in Babysitting? Well, I didn't have an agent. I didn't have an agent when I did... Uh, I had never met the guy that was doing my deal, uh, Johnny Planko over at yeah. William Morris. And uh, we got to know each other over the phone because he'd, every six months he'd have to renegotiate my deal. Not every six months, I think every 13 weeks or something like that. He'd have to renegotiate my deal. And I didn't know anything about deals. I didn't know anything about anything. And uh, so I got to know him a little bit. And then when I went back to... Uh, to New York, when I when I came back here, I uh, I met him for the first time, and he had three roles for me to do, and I was like, I don't want to do any of those parts, because um, they were all like fat weirdos, you know? <laughs> and I I didn't think of myself as a fat weirdo, and and uh, he said, oh, oh well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to wait. You know, I want to take off the weight, and I want to get back to who I am, and then let's start looking after that, you know. And so I did a couple of plays. I went back to work at the Hard Rack as a bouncer. Uh, this is true. And uh, I waited and ran and ran and ran and ran all that weight off and uh, got really healthy and then landed three movies in a row of more of, of uh, lines of like what I could sing, and little ones, you know, not nothing fancy, yeah. you know, little tiny little things that I thought I could show people that I could be completely different than I was in Full Metal Jacket. That's, that's not, my main concern was that I wanted to be so different that people, like not even that they would wreck, not even that people would go, oh wow, isn't he fabulous? I, I wanted it so different that people didn't even know that it was the same actor. Yeah. You know, because I knew eventually that if I kept doing it that way, eventually people would know. And then in hindsight, they'd be able to go back and say, oh, that, that's the same guy who, you know, rather than, you know, draw attention to myself. I, I did everything to not draw attention to myself. And, yeah, so I, I got, I did that, Adventures of Babysitting, Mystic Pizza, which I tried to get out of because, uh, uh, but I'm glad I didn't in, in the end, but I was fixated on Priscilla Presley. Yeah. She wanted me to, to play her husband, her ex-husband, Elvis, and, and she was just so beautiful, and the fact that she wanted me to play Elvis, I was like, of course, you know, if I can't sleep with you, I'll play Elvis, you know. <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> I mean, in hindsight, I would have been totally wrong for that part and probably would have made an ass of myself, but I wanted to do it and tried to get out of uh, Mystic Pizza, and uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't let me out. And uh, so it, n it never happened. But um, I ended up scoring a guitar out of it, and a really nice uh, national gut bucket out of it. And... Um, uh, because you were great in Mystic Pizza. I mean, you played Lily Taylor's... Oh, I had a blast doing yeah. that. Yeah. And Julia Roberts, that was her breakout film, right? Yeah, it was Lily's, too. Yeah. Mine, too. So what was it like working with the girls on that, working with Lily and with <laughs> they were Julia great. Roberts? They were so great. We, it was so great. I can't tell you. Annabeth Gish, yeah. who was another really phenomenal actress. Um, Julia was just, you know, a stick of dynamite waiting to go off. You know, you could just tell she was going to be huge. Lily was, you could just, she was the consummate... Chicago actor, you know, it's kind of phenomenal. So, I mean, if you can imagine all these young people getting together in Mystic, Connecticut and doing this kind of like, it was sort of like a Brat Pack movie, but it had more like realism to it. You know, we tried to bring more realism to it anyway. Um, it was so good. I mean, they were so talented. They were, they were all so talented in so many different ways. Annabeth, Lily, and, and Julia. And a good friend of mine, Adam Stork, was in too, who I love and adore. And, uh, it was just, it was just great. I mean, those scenes were so much fun with Lily. Yeah. You know. 
He also appeared in one of my favorite movies, which was um, The Championship Season. It's one of my favorite plays by Jason Miller. Yeah. And you did the TV movie version that was directed by with Paul Servino. Yeah. With and you played, played Phil. I played his part that yeah. he did on Broadway, yeah. What was it like working on that with that cast? I mean, you look at the people you had. Terry Kinney. Terry, Tony Shalhoub, Gary, Tony, yeah. Yeah. What was it like doing that and working with Paul Servino as a director and playing that role? What are your memories? Um, <laughs> it was it was okay, okay. <laughs> that says a lot. It was good. It was a lot of very talented people, and and uh, it was good. I think we did a good job. You were terrific in that film. Thank you, you all were. Well, we'll move on. You played Orson Welles in Tim Burton's Ed Wood. Right. Ed Wood fans out here. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not that good in that movie. I, I made a film later called Five Minutes, Mr. Wells, where yeah, I We're going to talk about that, too. It's a short film that you can actually watch on TV now. You can watch this film. It's really brilliant. Yeah. But you were not happy with your performance in Edward. I thought you were great in the film. Oh, thanks. I, I, I think I sucked. But, but you were like three weeks. You were hired really fast, right? Yeah. There was a lot of little things that happened. All my fault. Um, Tim's a genius. Johnny's a genius. They're just such exceptional people to work with. Um, I, my plate was too full okay. with other jobs. I was developing uh, the whole wide world, um, Velocity of Gary. I mean, no, uh, a Steelist movie. Um, I was developing two other characters simultaneously. I was hired. Uh, I should have been hired. I would say a few months earlier for, for, for Ed Wood than I was. I think that was the one mistake that that company made. They, um, they didn't hire me until three weeks before I was going to shoot, which mm -hmm. kept me kind of like, am I, should I be studying this part? Shouldn't I be? I'm very busy. So it was like a, a thing. So I kind of sort of got there and sort of didn't get there. And I, it only happened to me once in my career. That was the one time I've never... And it's for very practical reasons. I just didn't have the time. Basically, mm -hmm. I just didn't have the time, and I, I didn't. I wasn't going to fake it, so I did what I knew best, and and, and didn't fake it. And so it comes out sort of good and sort of not good in my, in my eyes. And during the research of that, though, I learned about the uh, cuckoo clock monologue that he actually wrote that. And uh, from the third man, yeah. uh, the one that he does in the Ferris wheel. And uh, I shot, I wrote a script with a friend of mine about the creation of that monologue and played Orson Welles in a room with a woman, which causes the creation of that monologue. Which, and that, it's called Five Minutes, Mr. Wells, and that's, uh, that opened the Venice Film Festival for shorts. And, and it's been a very successful film, and and it's traveled. I, I that film when I went after I finished it, it left. I had two two copies of it um, in, in reels of film, and uh, those two left for two and didn't come back for two years. They traveled the world. Those two things. So it was to me. It was like my. It made me feel so much better about my. Um, it just made me feel better that I could actually play Orson and get it right. Yeah. And that's the only reason why I made Five Minutes, Mr. Wells, is to answer that inside my stomach. I just felt sick about it. I, it was, you know, it's, acting is, is, I know it might sound ridiculous to some people, but it's, you know, you do some things in life. Like you, marry, you, 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 you meet and marry the woman that you're going to stay with for the rest of your life, my wife, Corinne. That I've done. You have children, and you raise them. That I'm doing. It's um, the only other thing I have that I care about is my work. And uh, I've never left it unanswered. I've never left any part of my work unfinished. And so that's why I had to make that movie. Well, it's a great film, mm -hmm. really great film.
Talk about working with director Robert Altman on the film The Player. So great. The guy used to carry half a joint in his pocket on set. <laughs> he was awesome. Robert Altman was awesome. I, I, I mean, he, I met Altman. I had quit acting, moved to Australia, um, goofed off in Australia, did some theater, whatever. I was mainly just goofing off. Uh, they were making nothing but Brat Pack, Brat, Brat Pack movies here. I didn't want to have anything to do with it. I left. Nobody cared that I left. I left. Um, uh, then I had to come back to the States to get some things done because I had bought a house out there in Australia and I had to organize some things here. And Altman came over, and I was eating breakfast, and he came over, found out where uh, well, I, I lived, and he came over and finished my breakfast and, <laughs> and um, asked me to do this thing. And I was like, yeah, man, I'll do it. Yeah, for sure. You know? And, you know, he, he's, he was just an amazing guy. He made you feel so talented. And so one thing he possessed is that, unless you were lazy, he didn't like he didn't like lazy actors. But um, so fortunately, I wasn't a lazy actor, and and, and we got along great. And um, we shot all that the, everything that I did in that movie we shot in one day. He had a long track. Uh, we did all the bar stuff, and then we had the whole outdoor scene, big conversation, and then I get killed by Tim. And. Uh, um, he had a long track set up on a with a set uh, with a baby jib sat on, set on it. A jib is a baby jib is a or a jib is a is a camera on a tripod that has a weight on one side and a camera on the other, and it's it just swivels like goes up and down or around. It can go anywhere as long as back then they had they had cable, so as long as you have a bunch of guys reeling up the cable, moving the cable so it's not in the shot, you can go anywhere you want. Actors can walk over the track, go on this side that way. You can go anywhere you want, and nobody sees anything. Um, as long as the shot is above the track and there's no cable in it, you're fine. So, you know, we knew our dialogue and, and we just went for it. It started with me peeing against the wall and then st ends up in this, in this puddle and it was just, you know, it was a phenomenal evening. I just, you know, you know, he's a little, you know, once you've rehearsals done, he gets, he used to get stoned and then, and then the shooting would start and, you know, camera would be floating around, and it's this very loose feeling, and you're acting your ass off, and everybody's having a good time, and it's like, you know, it made me, it made you feel like you were, like, in Hollywood in the 70s or something, you know, and it was, for an 80s actor, that was long gone, that feeling, so it was quite unique, and, uh, and I ha you know, and I'm so glad I had that experience, you know. Working with Oliver Stone in JFK. Yeah, I w also wasn't there very long for that. I yeah. was there for a day or so. And he, he asked me to recreate this actual real guy. And so he gave me all the footage of the real guy. I was doing another part, I think in Vancouver or something. And, and uh, he asked me to, if I could just do that. So I just completely stole the guy's personality off the tape. and recreated his voice and his look and everything like that and I showed up that day and I watched um, this bizarre recreation of the assassination over and over again for a full day and uh, and then were, was interviewed sort of like with this kind of live feeling but as this character and uh, got on a plane and left. And Oliver was uh, there, and you know we we hung out for a little bit, but um, we didn't really get to know each other very well. Sure. But, but he just you know gave me a slap on the back, and that was it. I love how movies are made. Some you go in for one day, you do your thing, you meet yeah. the director, you shoot, and you leave. Yeah, and that 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 little moment there has has uh, between us had we became friends later, and has continued to. Uh, A relationship from that moment continued over many years now. 
because there's archival footage of you also playing the same role of Bill Newman in Malcolm X for Spike Lee, right? That's what I hear, but yeah. I don't know. That Anybody that's see true. Malcolm X? Spike Lee's my, Malcolm X? Yeah. It Is says really archival. Yeah, you're billed all on the internet. He played yeah. Bill I, Newman I think that's twice. one of those I think weird, weird bullshitty things. It's a bullshitty thing on Wikipedia that someone got wrong. But you're actually listed in the film. It says archival footage. I know. I know. So I bet you it's from uh, maybe Oliver gave it to Spike. Maybe, yeah, and they never used it or something. Well, you were known to millions of fans for your role of Detective Bobby Gorin on Law and Order Criminal Intent. <laughs> How did the role happen for you? Um, did Jeff I don't know, just, you? you know, for, I, I, what happened? For some reason, a lot of television stuff was coming my way, and, and I kept on saying no to it all, and, um, um, you know, even Chase asked, asked me to do something on Sopranos, and I, I didn't want to do it, and, and then, uh, Dick, uh, uh, Offered me this thing. He sent me this script and and said that it was like a contemporary Sherlock Holmes. And I was always a fan of Sherlock Holmes. And and, and I read it and it was a pretty decent script, you know, for 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 that kind of law and orderish kind of thing. And and uh, you know, my wife looked at it and she kind of liked it. She was a, a law and order fan. I was never a law and order fan, but my wife was. And uh, she used to like the the the, the original show a lot. And um, and I met with Dick. We, I took him to. Uh, I'll never forget. He was wearing a blue suit and a pink tie. And I took him to this very bohemian restaurant in the East Village. He looked so out of place. And we <laughs> we we had lunch there, and we discussed what it would um, be, you know, what it would what would be expected of me. And the thing about Dick Wolf is he was a straight shooter. He said that it will take many years of your life away from you, and uh, you will make uh, a lot of money, but not near as much money as everybody else around you. And, uh, and we will probably hate each other by the end of it. And, uh, and he, he was pretty much right. <laughs> but we don't really hate each other. I mean, he's, he, he's, you know, he's one of those guys that He's just so good at the television business, you know, that there's that side of him you have to hate, you know. And then there, then there's this other side of him because he started as a writer that you just adore because he's so smart about story and stuff. So it's like I, can, I, I try to hate him and can't yeah. because I know that deep down there, even though he would hate if I said it, that he, there's a bit of, of an artist in there somewhere, you know. He just hates that part of himself, you know. But uh, but I, that's the part that I like the best. Yeah. Did you grasp the character right away of Bobby? Was it something that organically grew during the process of during rehearsals or shooting? Or where were you comfortable planned. with him the yeah, most? There was, yeah. there, I had a lot planned, and a lot of it they didn't let me do because they were nervous about it. And, and, and so, um, like, I, I'll, never, <laughs> I'll never forget... There's so many stories about it, because it was many, many years, but if anybody worked on that show, they can tell you the same stories. It's, it's pretty crazy stuff. Um, but the first thing that I didn't know about was I didn't know that in television that the marks are all set before you get there. So that was a little weird for me. Like, I walked out and I said, and I said, what are all these marks? And the director, who's, who became a really good, you know, a, a good friend after, uh, after many through the whole many years. Um, he said, well, you know, those are your marks. So when you, know, you walk over there, I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, go, uh, uh, you know. <laughs> I said, we need to rehearse, you know, and figure out where everybody goes and, you know, let the actors and the director figure that out together. You know, that's the way we do things. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and that didn't go over very big. <laughs> And uh, so we we sort of had this compromise where it was all in the way you said things, you know, like, <laughs> okay, so I, I, I figured it out fairly quickly that it was all in the way you presented things. I said, okay, so I'll tell you what, you give me my stage, like you give me the area 
that you need me to work in for your shots and stuff. And I'll use that as my stage and, and I'll block within that. We can block within that. Not just me, but the other actors and the, you know. And that worked. And so we would go in, there would be no marks. We would, he would say, okay, we need to shoot this over here. And so, and you know, I want this included in that included. So it's, it became like a film, you know? And it wouldn't take, it would take less time because uh, there was no, we would figure it out fairly quickly. And then there was no questions afterwards why an, act, why an actor was going over there if the actor didn't know by then when they were a numbskull because we would figure it out. And um, so there was that getting used to. And then I remember the, there was a pausing thing that they didn't like that I used to do. <laughs> and um, that, was a, that became a huge, huge issue with network wives <laughs> calling me and, you know, just uh, unbelievable. Um, uh, my, f you know, not shaving, you yeah. know, this woman called me one time and said she was so-and-so's wife, and I'm like, who? So-and-so who? <laughs> you know, she goes, you look better when you're shaved. And I said, well, I really don't want to shave. You know, I'm sorry to disappoint you. You know, blah, blah. oh, my God. <laughs> um, and then, so one time, this is very funny. I have to tell this one story. So one time, there's this big issue about me pausing. And, and I said, what do you mean? What, why can't I pause? He goes, well, you don't pause until it means dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. I go, it's not radio. <laughs> you know, it's like the you know, screen doesn't go black if you stop talking. <laughs> you know, the, the, uh, but, you know, so I would slide it in every now and then, and I would do it in a way that the editor would not be able to take it out. <laughs> and, and I got it in, like three or four times, this kind of Goran-esque pause that I was trying to build. You know, it's not like I paused for the sake of pausing. It was a character thing that I wanted to irritate the audience and the guy yeah. or girl that I was speaking to, everybody simultaneously with. I, it was a purposely done to for to annoy people <laughs> so that you know so that at home they would get a little moved in some way uh, even if it was annoying I didn't care um, in fact I thought it was really appropriate at times for that character to be a bit annoying and a bit um, egocentric and narcissistic and so um, <laughs> so I did it a few times and it got in the show and they were, you know, they were just like, we can't cut around that because, uh, so it was a, an issue. So there was a bit of tension and then one day we're shooting in the West Village, this is a true story, and I'm walking down the street with um, Dick Wolf and Renee Balsay, the ride, the show runner, the first show runner that we had. And this woman comes out of this little cafe and she stops, she goes, Gorin! And I'm like, I wasn't quite used to the whole Goran thing yet. And she's like, uh, I go, yeah. And, you know, we all stopped. And she goes, I love you. I love you. She goes, Harry's inside. My husband Harry's inside. He's not feeling well this morning. Could you come in and just say hello to him? <laughs> and I thought this was awesome because, you know, Dick is here. Yeah. Renee is asked. Like, all right, great. Let's go. So we go into this cafe, and they're all standing there, and they're in their ties, and I'm dressed like a cop in my ties. So it's these three big guys with ties, you know, standing at the end. Harry's there. And, he, and they're so sweet. They were from Queens. I think her name was Margaret. I remember Harry. And uh, she goes, tell him about the kitchen, right? He goes, <laughs> Margaret. He goes, she goes, tell him about the kitchen. He goes, well, he goes, last night, you guys were on, it was the show about la 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 and la la la, and they get into the whole story, and you're like, yeah, yeah, I get it, I get it. And then she goes, he goes, I, I went up to, uh, to, to, to get, uh, uh, you know, to get, to get the TV dinner or whatever they were getting out, the, out of the kitchen, right? And um, I had 
said to her, I'm not going to leave the show this tonight. Tonight, you leave the show. I'm not leaving the show. But she made me get up and get the stuff anyway, Margaret. <laughs> so I left the show. And sure enough, when I'm in the kitchen, I hear, Harry, come quick. He's pausing. He's pausing. <laughs> It's a true story. That's classic. Classic New York. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and Dick and Renee are right there. I never had a problem after that. <laughs> never had a problem. One time, and, and okay. which made me start to begin to get away with a lot of the things, because I, without changing a word of the dialogue, I would block the thing in such a way that they never expect it. You know, and there was this one point, and this one thing where I, I, it wasn't scripted, but I spill my coffee all over my notes, and I'm actually wringing my notes out <laughs> while I'm interviewing the guy because it's an actual interrogation, but I want it to seem like an interview, so I, I just want to seem like a bubbling any. I think it was like the second episode or something, or third episode, the doctor or something like that. And you should have seen, you know, I said, well, you know, he goes, what are you doing? The, the writer was like, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, well, I'm gonna, I spilled my coffee all over my nose, so now I have to spend the whole rest of the scene, and Kate, too, were cleaning up the mess that I made, which is going to put him as a, in a kind of confused, at ease, give him the power kind of state, where meanwhile, I'm actually interrogating him, but he seems like he's the smarter one because he's not the bumbling cop who spilled the coffee. But why would you spill a coffee? It's not part of the story. I said, well, it helps tell the story. Like, it's not actually part of the story. Like, it's not in here, yeah. but it helps tell this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I swear. So, uh, you know, it was a big deal. Like, everybody, you know, we shut down. I'm not kidding. Wow. We shut down for like an hour. People came down. We talked about it and stuff like that. And so we eventually decided that, you're not going to believe this, but after a very long discussion, we decided we'd try it. <laughs> TV. And then we did it, and it worked, and we went on and moved on with our day. You know, it's incredible. Wow. So that, that's, that's what that was like for me. It was, a, it was in, this incredible creative process, which was a bit of a, a battle because I was like this, um, you, know, and I, you know, I looked like an arrogant prick, too. You know, I mean, I was, <laughs> I was a lot younger, and, you know, I was, I was like all ready and, you know. Um, so that took, that first four years was all about development. Back to your question, was all about development. You know, Dick was actually on set when I came up with the lean thing. I don't know if you guys know about yeah. that, but it became like a thing on the internet. Um, Dick was actually there, and I, I said, Dick, you know, I, I, I said, the guy, the actor, the actor, not the character, the actor playing the character kept looking down at the table and I said, I want to do this thing where I go down and find his eyes and bring the actor's eyes back up. And Dick was like, uh, how are you going to do that? I said, well, I can just lean over <laughs> and do it. He goes, okay, go ahead. And uh, yeah, in the frame, I said, just follow me with the camera. You know? And so you know, it became this, you know, the guy's like this. You know? <laughs> You know, and he's talking. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he's holding the fucking thing, and he's like, oh, going down. And that became like a, a, a thing. So it was a, the whole thing was a, a process, you know? And then it became less fun because then they started to write to that kind of stuff, and then it's not so fun anymore. <laughs> Great cast. Great cast. Kate was oh, yeah. unbelievable, and Courtney and Jamie. I mean, that original cast of our show was just, you know. There was ace. Those were ace actors. I mean, Courtney Vance, man, the fences. You know, the, 
You know, I saw that show three times just to see him in yeah. concert. So when I was a kid. Yeah, we had a great cast. What do you miss the most of not doing the show now? It's not a lot. I don't miss a lot. I think the idea of having a job that you go to on a daily basis is a nice thing. I like that about it. Um, I miss the faces, like I, I miss like the camera guys. I miss them. You know, I'm still friends with. There's, you know, one one of the operators is a really good friend. The stunt guy is yeah. a really good friend of mine. The there are guys that we're gonna be friends until we're like old men, you know, on a porch somewhere now because of that show. Um, so I miss hanging out with them on a daily basis. So now I have to like we have to get plan to get together and stuff yeah. like that. Um, working with you know Kate and looking at her and watching her act, you know, I've never seen anybody handle exposition like that woman can. You know. Um, I miss those those bits of it a lot, yeah. you know. And you know, the idea of telling story is just so much fun, you know. <clears throat> and when it's written in that television um, format, it's so stripped of anything filmic that it's really basically story, 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 story. Yeah. And you become addicted to the telling of it and how to execute the telling of it in a way that people would not expect. And, and uh, I think that some of the directors who, we started with seven or eight directors and we ended, I, I ended up only using three out of those, the, 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 the top three of those eight that, that rotated my last few years yeah. there because they were so good at that same thing, just telling story, story, story. You know, I'm sure everybody would love as an actor to do a series that would run 10 years. But what did you give up? I mean, how, do you, how did you juggle family during all of that? Was that difficult? Were those one of the yeah. challenges of all of that? Yeah, I mean, that's why I stopped. Yeah. It was because of that, because my kids started getting older. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I stopped because of that. And I tried to, you know, go out slowly, but they, they just wouldn't have it. You know, they, no. didn't, they didn't want me to go. We were making so much money. I mean, that... You know, people usually don't talk about these things, but I don't give a shit. The, uh, the, uh, you know, that thing sold really early. It sold, it sold at 80 episodes, which usually go, they usually sell at like 100. We went uh, into the licensing fee uh, deal at 80 episodes for like wow. 3.2 million an episode. That's a lot. Yeah, and 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 so that you got to imagine that sold over and over and over again to every local station throughout the world. Over and over and over. <laughs> Would so you like to revisit guys, him? Those guys made, made a, a lot, lot of, money. of money, and you know, you they don't want you to leave them. Yeah. Because they know if you go, then all the money goes. The money machine stops. Yeah. So it's hard to get them to let you go. You, yeah. know, you have to really talk to them for a long time to get yeah. them to let you go. So I had to kind of squeeze my way out. You know. Yeah. I had to be, you know, I had to like, you know, Dick was very helpful when it came to that because he would say, okay, well, we'll bring somebody in, and you do half, and they'll do half. And so we started that stuff. And, you know, that kind of worked. It kind of didn't. And then and then eventually they were like, okay, the guy doesn't want to do the show anymore. You know, after, like, me telling them for, like, four years straight, I don't want to do the show anymore, one day it clicked. Oh, he doesn't want to do the show anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and so they got Jeff, and and I thought that Jeff would be, would, was going to be the perfect person to replace me because he's just so good. And the audience wouldn't have it. And, and then um, Dick called me one day and said, will you just come back and do eight and we'll end the show forever. And, and I did. And, we, we sh and then this guy, Chris Brancato, came on, this, our, our new showrunner, who is just an awesome guy, and uh, who I'm still friends with to this day, and who I just saw a couple days ago. And um, we, I got all of my original crew back. You know, because a lot of politics happen in shows sure. and people are in and out and out. So I said yes, but uh, you know, all my crew comes back. You know, uh, Chris came. This guy Chris came in, Bercato, 
and he wrote, you know, eight kick-ass episodes, and um, we had a blast, and we just finished the show that way. It was the perfect way to finish the show. Would you like to revisit him, like, as a movie of the week or a special? I, if Dick asked me to do it, I would do it, yeah. Right in. Everybody right in, right? Go on the internet. Get him back, right? Yeah. Well, I want to get into some of your films. Men in Black. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many Men in Black fans? <laughs> what a great character. How much of that character was on the page, and how much did you come up with? Oh, um, very, very little was on, I mean... I mean, if Barry was here, he would tell you. I mean, it's like, you know, he, Barry, Barry uh, Seinfeld, he's an interesting guy. I love him to death. And, you know, if you guys met him, you, you know, he's just so interesting. He's, he's so sweet and interesting guy. And, uh, but he doesn't like, you know, he, 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 he sent word out to me that he wanted me to play the part, but he didn't want to speak to me because he was afraid that I was going to talk about acting, and he didn't want to talk about acting. <laughs> And so I, I said, him, I said, I told him, meet your friend. I, I won't talk to him about acting. Just, you know, what does he want me to do? You know. So they sent me this script, and the guy's name was Edgar, and the bug's name was Edgar, and you know, it was just, yeah, there was no, no idea on, there was no description on what the hell was going on. Only that he was an insect, and and that uh, they weren't even sure what kind of insect yet, and. And, um, you know, they, he just said, you know, what, you know, do you think you can do this? And I, I said, yes, but I didn't really know that I could or what I would do. I would just say, wow, you know, yeah, I want to, I want to, you know, it's Tom, Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith in a sci-fi movie about aliens living amongst us. Yeah, I'll try. <laughs> yeah. And I get to be the bad guy. That's awesome. You know, uh, but then, you know, it sunk in that it was like, wow, I mean, what, what am I going to do? You know, I, I, and I wasn't allowed to talk to the director about it. So it was <laughs> like I was, <laughs> I was out there on my own. And um, I started to watch, like, the most boring documentaries on bugs and insects. <laughs> and, you know, I thought I'd be able to, you know, do the, as a clever, you know, method actor, come up with, something really cool that I, you know, and I'd be able to say in interviews later, I researched bugs and came up with, but that didn't work out for me. I, I tried and I just bored myself to tears. And, uh, and then, you know, I was, I was, I was going to bed one night and I was, you know, I, a lot of, a lot of like, I, I, I talked to a lot of people about, a lot of people are, are most creative, like if they just spend time on their pillow, you know, before they go to sleep and they just riff on, whatever they're working on, you know? And th I've always done that over the years, and I, my, my attention always went to, and I know this is silly because we're talking about a sci-fi movie and a bug, but it's the work, you know? And it's uh, important, because otherwise it wouldn't have come out the way it did. The, my, my mind always kept drifting to the frustration of this giant thing inside this human body, and how horrible that must have been, you know, for the poor guy. And, uh, and I kept thinking, you know, it must have been terribly frustrating so, and claustrophobic. And so I started to riff on that, you know. And then I was walking by a sporting goods store in uh, Los Angeles. And in the window were these um, braces that basketball players wear on their knees. Wow. And I, I thought, shit, you know, I'm going to try that. And I went in and I bought a pair of them. And I went home, I bought some duct tape. And I went home and I duct taped all the things on my legs so that, so that I locked them off like that. And then I duct taped my ankles so I couldn't rotate my feet at all. And I, I just locked everything like that. You know? And then I just tried to walk normal. You know? <laughs> and it immediately, I tried to do I washed the dishes. You know, I watched some TV, I walked around the house like that for a couple of hours, and I really started to get annoyed by it, you know? And I thought, this is, this, this is something. This is the beginning of something. And I wore those braces. Uh, and it built this frustration up in me. 
and that's how the whole walk of the character started and stuff. And, um, you know, when we did the makeup test and stuff, I didn't, uh, I was working with Rick Baker for many months. He's such a, we became very good friends. And we were developing the makeup, and he was the only one that was seeing what I was doing, you know. So we were developing everything together, you know. He would come up with these great designs, but everything was matching what I was doing physically. So we were able to, like, be in sync, Rick and I. He's an amazing artist, that guy, and the stuff he comes up with is incredible. And, uh, but so during the makeup test and the wardrobe test, we were in this, and, and, and uh, so the guys in the back in the darkness, they would go, so are you going to do a little something that you're, I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going to do it. Like, well, can you tell us what you're going to sound like? No, nah, no, nah, nah, I'm not going to do it. Actually, I didn't know what I was going to sound like yet. <laughs> and, uh, and Barry didn't want to see it. He didn't want to just, you know, he was like, please just bring it in. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. Yeah. And uh, I was I was watching Chinatown uh, with uh, with John Houston, and I, I and he, in it he said he go, he says uh, he's talking he's the pond, you know. And I'm like, fuck, that's nice, you know. But it's too slow, you know. And so I thought of somebody else that I could buy. I thought of George C. Scott, you know. So I combined George C. Scott's voice and and uh, John Houston. So it's, it's sort of like pond skull, you know, <laughs> like that. And uh, so I, I had the voice, and I was totally thoroughly into that, and and you know worked on this whole frustration thing of being like trapped in a, a helmet and a, and this, my body distorted in a very so that every limb that moved hurt another limb. So if I if I walk too fast arch my back and like everything was connected so I know it sounds silly but that's what we did and uh, so the first day of shooting the first scene was the Orkin <laughs> scene where I put the pipe down the Orkin guy you can tell me straight now I don't remember it exactly but I have to walk from the barn doors into the into the scene to confront the guy and so nobody had seen it I mean nobody knew anything and and uh, oh man, if you could have seen, <laughs> heard the silence, it was unbelievable. It was really unbelievable. It was all the producers were there, right? Everybody was there to watch this. Everybody right? was there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there, he says action, and I do this thing, and you know, voice, you know, do the voice, whatever it was, and and, and I hear uh, cut <laughs> midway through the scene, you know, because I just finished the walk over there. And I hear that from behind the monitors, he has a cigar bear. He goes, he goes, do you think that that works? Like that. And that's not a good sign. Like, that you don't want to hear that from a director. That's not the sentence you want to hear after you've done your scene. You know? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I think it works. I said, well, let's, let's discuss it. Let's discuss it. Can we just have some time? That's another bad sign. Yeah. <laughs> when a director wants to clear the set, you know, because we want time, that's not a good sign. So everybody leaves, and uh, he, I'm there in my costume and with my legs all tied up and everything. <laughs> and uh, he goes, Vincent, do you really think this is going to work? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, he goes let me see it again. So I go, oh, I'm going to do the thing again. He's like, and what happens when you run? And I, I run for him. And he goes, and what happens when you sit? And I sit, you know. And, and this will play through the whole movie <laughs> like this, he goes. And I'm like, yeah. And he thought about it, and he goes, well, we'll see. We'll see, he goes. Now, that's a vague answer. We'll see. That, it's, a, it's a vague statement. Okay, so now I had to keep shooting with this vague answer, well, we'll see, and still be totally committed to what I was doing, you know. And uh, 
And then he just sort of forgot about it and <laughs> like never said anything to me. And then about a month later, we're at Paramount Studios and we're shooting the big climax scene and where you know the spaceship crashes and we're on this giant set. It's fabulous with this giant spaceship and this entrance and that I come out of the spaceship and that's Paramount. It's just before the bug appears and and we're about two weeks from doing that actual. They had these huge puppets made, five hundred thousand dollars a piece. So I was told by the producers in my trailer. Vincent, do you, do you know that we spent uh, $500,000 on two giant puppets? That are, is the character inside you? And I'm like, nope. He goes, well, we can't use those puppets now because this is, this is the first time I knew I wasn't going to get fired after like a month of shooting because your character moves way too more, in, more, more interesting than we could ever do with these puppets. So we have to do the whole thing in CGI now at the end. And we weren't planning on doing that, but that's what we have to do. So that was the first time I knew that I was, number one, not going to get fired, and number two, that they liked oh, wow. what I was doing. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you just put yourself out there as an actor and do what you feel you should be doing. Well, that's the thing. I mean, if you're a student out there, I mean, that's the yeah. thing. You can't lose. Failure is everything. I mean, you got to go all the way every time and accept that failure is always an option. Always. Yeah. Interesting. Another great movie, The Cell, playing that serial killer. Scary movie. Mm -hmm. One of the scariest. How many people, The Cell? Yeah. What was it like creating that character and working on that film? Well, I liked Tar Sam a lot, the director. Yeah. He was like a visual thief. You know, he would steal from all the great artists and put them in his sets and stuff. You know, he was, that was kind of cool. I'd never seen it that blatant before. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. truly, it was the way that he would take other people's art and transform them into this kind of filmic thing it was fascinating to me. I liked him a lot. We got along great. Um, the development of the character, the, I had to play, I think, four of his self-images in his head. So it was basically the equivalent of five different characters I was playing. And so that was interesting, because that, I, I, um, I separated myself from my wife and my, young, my youngest at the time. I went into a, a hotel room and I filled the room with pictures of, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you what they were, but it was just stuff that would put me in this kind of state of mind of, of um, this kind of sexual deviant and also dark, um, dark place. So uh, talking a lot to uh, a, a connection that I had, which I've used over the years uh, um, of the FBI, uh, because they used to help me out with certain stuff when I would play uh, people that committed heinous crimes. And um, so it was pretty pretty dark period, but what, what came out of it was very interesting because I was able to put together, I was also reading a lot of case studies, and I was able to put together um, with uh, with Tarsen's, uh, with always going back to Tarsem and asking, is this okay, is this okay, and asking for his approval. Um, this whole case study of my character. And so it was from that case study that I was able to develop each of his self-images from. Because that was in the movie already. He had these self-images. But the self-images in the script didn't really make sense to me until I could figure out the real who the real guy was. So I had to figure out who the real guy was, and then suddenly, oh, this one could be this one. And then that would influence the, the um, wardrobe, makeup, everything. We, we would start, things would start to slightly change and move in more of a psychological direction that made more sense to, 
all of us, so if we were all on the same page, that people weren't designing things just because of the way they looked, but they had to actually deal with the psychology of the character in, in, in my characters, um, as far as my character is concerned. And which was very cool, it was a very cool process. Uh, that's what I remember most about it was that process because I remember starting building that case study which then led to a color that my skull was in, you know, eventually in the movie. So it was all very well thought out with Tarsem and the, Tarsem and, and the, and the uh, wardrobe and the, and the makeup people, these all extremely great artists, you know, just extremely talented. And so that was quite a process. I mean, the movie's okay, you know, it's, I remember the first cut, there was, you know, she wasn't, Jennifer wasn't in the movie for like a half hour, and they were like, you can't make a movie with Jennifer Lopez and have her not in it for a half hour. Sorry, pal, you know, to Tarsem. And so they, he had to recut the whole thing, and um, which I totally get, you know, she told me you can't do that. And uh, um, uh, so it was the movie that is out there is not exactly what Tarsem had in mind. S so th it suffers a little bit because of that. I don't know why he thought he was going to be able to get away with that. But he did, you know. Artists are funny people. And but I, I would, you know, so, so when I think about the cell, I always think about, I wonder you know, what that real version would be like, you know. I've never saw, I never saw it, I, I've never seen it, I only heard that they weren't gonna accept it. And uh, so I've never really been, I, I don't know what the real true movie looked like. I know it wasn't the movie that we all saw, I saw or, or that was out there. But I, I'm sure it was it, uh, extremely intense. I just wish that, I mean, I mean, you could you could never make a. It was a seventy million dollar movie back then. Jennifer was so bankable that you could make just have her name on anything, and it would you could get seventy million dollars. And uh, but you can't make an experimental film about a serial killer for seventy million dollars and think you're gonna like put Jennifer only in it for like twenty minutes or something. You know. So that was a mistake on the on on the whole production's part, I thought. But. Um, but man, is that guy talented though. Tarsem is an extremely talented guy. I had a great time doing that movie actually. In hindsight, I think about it. It'd be nice if you know a director's cuts DVDs coming out, if the studio believed in it enough that would let him put his vision of this movie out. Be great yeah, to see. I wonder. The, yeah. the thing about Tarsem though is, you know, Tarsem is going to one day make a great film. Yeah. I, I, I think that this guy Tarsem Danwar is going to change, uh, is going to do something phenomenal in cinema. Yeah. You played another serial killer in Jennifer Lynch's Chained. Has anybody seen Chained? It's a crazy movie. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend going to yeah. it. <laughs> but you like working with her, right? Yes, very much. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, uh, I mean, if you're an actor, I would go see it because there's a lot of uh, intense uh, character work in it from all the actors in it. Um, it's not something I would sit at home by myself and watch yeah. or, you know, watch, you know, with the kids or anything. Uh, it's a funny business, this business, because you want to do really good work, but you also want people to see it, you know? Um, and I'm a sucker for like interesting parts, so I end up doing these like parts that I know going in nobody's ever gonna see. Like I knew going into Chain that it would have a very limited audience, and you know that most people, including my wife, by the way, who watched five minutes of it and then didn't sleep in the same bed with me for like two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I knew they weren't gonna watch it. I knew going in, people are not gonna watch it. But I do it anyway because I I have these ideas. You know, I get yeah. these ideas of. I mean, just the challenge these days of creating a killer on film, that challenge alone is a huge challenge because it's been done so many different ways and so well over the years, since forever in Hollywood. 
and uh, I mean, I think of Robert Mitchum. And, I mean, just you know, just to down the line, it's like amazing. Mm -hmm. In the night comers or something, do you remember that? The night hunter, night, night, hunter. night of the night hunter, hunter, right? Yeah, night of the night hunter, hunter. Right. right, right, right. Shelley Winters, Robert right, Mitchum, exactly. scary movie with like scary. evil or hell yeah, on his fingers. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Yeah. And his acting in that is just phenomenal. It's yeah. a, I mean, in that and Ryan's daughter, he's like ace in my opinion. Yeah. Um, so that alone as a challenge, so, so to approach things in a, in a very human way when it comes to, I mean, there's a lot of scary movies out there with killers in them, but they're all nonsense, you know. Yeah. But to, to create it in a very kind of real way, in a very human way, is a, is a challenge for an artist to do. And to create any character in a very human way, in a psychological way, and, and, to, and for that psychological thread to work throughout the storytelling in a really fine way, in a really, you know, in a really grounded way. To combine that kind of work with a story is a very difficult thing to do. And I love doing it, so I don't turn those parts down. I do them, and, and Jennifer's is a very hands-on director and a lovely lady, but she's got this wild taste, you know? And so you know going in that, uh, you know, not a lot of people are gonna see the movie now, you know? And if she asked me to do another one, I would do it immediately. You know, if, if I liked the part, I would do it, you know? Yeah. Just because she's an artist, I would just help her out. But, you know, so I would say if you're an actor, I, I would say watch it or a director, just to see what Jennifer did. But um, if you just want to see a good movie, I would. That's not the one. <laughs> but, you know, right, you, I mean, yeah. yeah, I'd watch Saving Private Ryan or something like exactly. that. Exactly. You know, your body of work goes on and on, on, but you also, you're a producer, you're a director. Talk about directing. Do you like going behind the camera and take, wearing those hats? I do, but I just kind of, I mean, I'm going to do it again soon, but I just kind of do it for fun. You know, I, I don't really consider myself a director. Um, I thought of this idea that I could shoot in 12 days for $100,000, which was a slasher musical, so we shot it and we made it and it was fun. <laughs> and uh, we shot it in my, my backyard in upstate New York and it was a load of fun. All my friends got together and we had a great time and everybody, I cast it off the street. We didn't use a casting director. I cast real kids off the street. And, and we just shot it and everybody sang and everybody died. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was fun and uh, the five minutes, Mr. Wells thing was a was a was a big, you know, was a. I, I'm really proud of that. You know, I had some really great artists working on that, and you know, it's a very different film than than Don't Go in the Woods, the one I was talking about. But it's um, it was just as much fun, but but approach the approach was in a completely different way, more methodical way, and it's a much more serious movie, and the cinematography is beautiful and everything. Um, don't go in the woods. It's just, just like this gun and run thing of this idea that I had before I went to sleep one night, and I thought, why can't we do this? You know, let's make a movie. Let's make a movie. Yeah, and um, yeah. So I I do like it. You know, I do like it. Will Will I ever consider myself a director? I, I don't know about that. We'll see. I don't know. It's a, it's debatable. I I love really love acting, and I just think it's all an extension of that. Mm -hmm. And what about producing? You produce some that great I'm films. I'm definitely a producer. I mean, I've produced so many things now, and I just love it. I, we have another film that I wrote just, just being finished um, called Mall, which is a very relevant film about, um, about uh, social violence in America, which has a lot to do with uh, guns and stuff that, that's happening right now. And, and so that's, a, that's um, my friend uh, Joe Vinceguero and Sam Bisbee, and I, we mm -hmm. wrote this from a... Uh, Bogosian novel, Eric Bogosian's first novel called Mall. And we're done with the movie, and uh, this guy Joe Hahn directed it. Lincoln Park is doing the score for it. I just saw the, what's going to be like the next to last cut of it. It's, it's beautiful. It's, it works in such a good way. And, uh, and so that's, you know, we're, we're, we're tying that all up. We're going to finish it soon, and that'll come out probably at the end of summer. And, uh, I just, we just, we're making a deal now with the writer to write this other idea that I had that we'll start. I'm going to go do a movie in Boston with Robert Duvall and Robert Downey Jr. called The Judge. We're going to play sons to his dad. It's going to be really intense. It's a very intense family story. Very, very fucked up and intense. It's going to be great. <laughs> and, uh, 
while I'm doing that, we'll start writing this other idea that I have. And uh, and I don't know that I'll direct it, but I, I know for sure that you know it'll be produced in May. Yeah. You also did that movie, The Velocity of Gary. You were in. Yes, and in the whole wide world. Yeah. Yeah, I did those two things with Dan Ireland. Him and I were enjoying working with each other for a while, and uh, I produced both of those movies. Yeah. Yeah. I also want to talk about teaching. You teach. I do. Yeah. At two different places. It's the the Lee Strasberg. Well, I, I mainly teach here in New York at the Strasberg Institute. Yeah. Okay. What do you get out of that as a teacher? What's the biggest thrill for you? What do you get out of it? Or what do you enjoy doing about it? I do it because I work with a lot of bad actors. <laughs> you mean in films? In films. And okay. yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's really that simple. I mean, there's so much nonsense going on out there yeah. that, uh, you know, when I'm on a film or a I, I run into a good actor who's young, and I just, I, I, I can't believe it. I'm shocked at how good they are. I, I'm just so, it's like, I'm so happy that they're alive and that they're doing what they're doing. You know, like I remember the first time I met Ben Foster, I was like, dude, you know, I, I'm so happy you're around, you know. Um, if you're an actor and, in your, and you're in the audience right now, I hope you're studying, and I hope you're not lazy, and I hope you're reaching every time to do the best work you can. You should be going to museums, studying art. You should never, ever not be not thinking of the arts. If you're working in a bar, you should be in museums more than that bar. I mean, I meet these, I cannot believe people are, end up on a set. I can't believe it. I'm shocked. It's all about a face and nothing else or whatever. Well, I just, I'm just shy. I have no idea why they're there. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Guys and girls. I, I'm just totally in shock about it. And then every once in a while, you'll meet like a, a, a guy or a girl or a young man or a young woman who's like amazing. And so, and I say, where do you study? And they all you know, have been studying constantly for years and, are, and their whole lives are consumed by, by the arts and there needs to be more. And there's so much opportunity out there for you young people and, and not just young people, but older people too. Um, if you're in your 30s or 40s or 50s or 60s, wherever you are, if you're just starting acting, there's a lot of room out there for actors. You can steal parts like that. There is so much crap out there right now that if you have any talent and know how to execute it, you have a chance at working in theater and in film. Because they are blindly walking kids through performances. You know, giving them line reading, speaking to them while they're acting. You know, it's mind boggling. It's like there's other jobs that they could be doing. <laughs> yeah. So, so what, what I do is I, I go back to my roots and I, I teach what I was taught and I, I'm completely committed to it and I, I go through a, a um, I don't pretend like I'm, like I know it all when it comes to acting. I go through a, a, um, a period of time with my students and and we slowly and surely we together we I turn them slowly into artists without thinking that I know and I'm the the one that has the ultimate wisdom when it comes to acting and for sure I don't but what I do teach them is is to is that failure is is everything and that and that you really have to put yourself out there. You really have to study. You really have to do research. You really have to know what's going on, you know. And there's, I don't want to, I'm being kind of wishy-washy and vague about it because there's a whole technique of acting called method acting that I teach. But I'm not going to sit here in front of you and, and explain that to you because that would take six hours to do. And that's how long our classes are. There's six hours apiece. And 
they're very intensive. And um, I teach them here, and I teach them in Los Angeles. And and uh, and and and, and uh, there's working actors now, and and they're out there, and they're uh, they're actually real real actors. And so that's why I do it. I do it because um, to have more you know actors out there that know how to act and know how to act like in the real way you're supposed to and not just modeling or whatever there's nothing wrong with modeling but it's two different jobs yeah you know that's great advice thank you for that we're going to open this to some of the questions that came in from the audience this first question is did you have a mentor if so what bit of advice did they give you that made a great impression in your career sharon chatton was my mentor yeah and she it's not so much of as, as like a sentence of advice or a, a brief thing that she taught she taught me. It's a it's she taught me how to be a method actor and she taught me about sensory work. She taught me about character work. She taught me about script um, analysis. Um, uh, everything that I do and exercise and execute as an actor every day when I'm working is comes from her. And and I still, when I'm in Los Angeles, I take her classes over. Now Sharon is a very unique woman because she was, she studied under Strasberg and then started teaching on her own. And she would invite her, her most dedicated students to the actor's studio. And so we got to, to see a lot of great people fail and, and, and realize that they're you know, that there's no difference. The only thing that separates us is experience. The only thing that separates me from any actor, young actor in the audience right now is, is experience. I don't know a secret. There's no mysterious thing or secret thing that I know that makes me successful. The only thing, again, that separates us is experience. And so she taught us that. Um, now I'm able to go and take her classes over. And so she sits in the classes and I, and I, I teach them. And uh, at the same time I'm teaching, I'm remembering everything at the same time. You know, Keeps me on my toes. Is there a role you'd like to play or a type of character that you haven't? I'm sure yeah. there must be millions of them, I would imagine. There's got to be. I, I would have no idea what how to answer that other than there must be hundreds and hundreds of characters that I would like to play. Yeah. Um, what's the reason behind why you and Modine were at each other's, you were at each other's throats during production of Full Metal Jacket? Was it an acting thing or a clash of personalities? Um, we had we did have a little thing actually. Now I don't know who it is that wrote that that knew that, but. <laughs> What was that over? It was over. It was two young men, him and I. We got something happened that we got irritated with each other. Really? Yeah. On it was set? brief. Yeah. Not on set. No, we kept it very personal. Something happened okay. though. It was. I, it, I think it, I'm not. I can't remember actually what it was, but it was something. You're, whoever wrote that is is right. It was brief. Okay. And we worked it out. We're still like best of friends, but. Um, if I could remember, I would tell you the truth, but I can't really remember what it was. Okay. How did you get your first agent? Um, it was a, she was a theater agent, and um, I think her name was Anita Castle. And I just kind of went to her office, and I, I hear from my students that you can't do this anymore, but um, you can't. That's what I hear. Oh. You can't even get into the buildings because of the security and stuff. You can't even put a picture under the door anymore, right? Didn't you just like slide a picture like one day a week you could put a picture under the door? And if it was the wrong day, they slid the picture right back again? <laughs> you can't, it, it, how many people are looking for an agent in the audience tonight? How many people are looking for an agent? That's like the hardest thing. I think you get an apartment easier than an agent. Yeah, I mean, so it's really hard for me to help them out when it comes to that kind of stuff. I mean. I, I wish I could just wave a wand and just give them work, but I can't do that. I mean, I would, I would love to be able. Some of them eventually, 
get it on their own anyway somehow, and they're awesome at what they do. I mean, I that's what I did. I went to there, I knocked on the door, and uh, and she opened the door, and I said, you know, I'm an actor, and uh, I'm sure you've heard that before, and uh, I think that I can make you money. That's what I said. And she goes, how would you do that? And I said, I think that if you represented me, I would get paid, and then you would get a percentage of that. <laughs> and she signed you. And she said, well, uh, okay. She said, come in. And she goes, what have you done? And I said, nothing. And she said, when are you going to start doing stuff? I said, as soon as you start sending me out. <laughs> and uh, she goes, well, I can send you on a couple of things. You know, just give me some time. Don't, you know, she was, I was think I was being a little too pushy. And she said, um, you know, just give me time. And, and, and I said, oh, okay. And, and so I left and I, but by the time I got home, I called her. And I said, I just, you know, there's like everything out there I could do, like anything out there. I just want you to know that whatever you're thinking of me, <laughs> like don't think that, just think that I could do anything. And she said, okay, Vincent, thank you. You know, like a click, yeah. And you know, the biggest, the biggest thing is, uh, I won't say her name, but for you young actors out there, there was a, a huge casting agent out there. I hope she's not here right now. Um, she was huge back then in the 80s. And um, there was a movie being cast called Baby It's You. Remember the John Sayles movie? Yeah. And I went up for that. And uh, she goes to me, she goes, you are just so good. And I said, thanks. And I was so happy because it was like the first time. It was really like one of the first films that I ever auditioned for. for. She goes, but I would stick to theater if I was you. And I said, oh. You know, she goes, your nose is too small to be a, a film actor. She goes, and I, I was like, I crushed. And she goes, now, she goes, just think about it. Think about all the famous actors and their noses. <laughs> and I'm like, fuck, you know what, you're right. <laughs> yeah. And so I went home, you know, crushed. And then I went to my acting teacher, and Sharon, who was awesome, and she goes, uh, she goes, come here. So there's like... Five, uh, ten people, other students there, half girls, half guys. You know. And she goes, uh, this is true. And I know this sounds weird, but it's true, so I'm going to tell her. She goes, sit down. I go, okay. She goes, who of you girls want to fuck him? Everybody's hand went up, right? Everybody's hand went up. And she goes, she goes like this, you feel better now, stupid? <laughs> That's a great teacher. This is from a 16-year-old struggling actress. What were you up to when you were 16? I wasn't up to acting. I wish I could say. I wish I had acted earlier. But when I was 16, I was still bumping into walls and drooling. <laughs> I didn't have a, is it a girl that asked the question? Yes. Yeah, so you, you guys, you women are way ahead of us guys, you know? When guys are 16, we're complete idiots. You know, when girls are 16, they're awesome already. So um, I'm sure you're way ahead of me. I love that. Any plans of returning to TV in the near future? I hope so, one day. We try, Ethan and I tried this. Well, we actually sold this thing to NBC. They bought it, but they never made it. But um, yeah, there's things, you know, maybe. Yeah, maybe. We'll see. This is a question on Law and Order, Criminal Intent. What was your favorite episode, and who was your favorite character on that episode? Do you have a favorite? On my show? On your show. You mean my the favorite bad guy or something? Or yeah, a favorite episode or a favorite character other than I yeah. think the one with Griffin Dunn is my favorite. Yeah, yeah. Griffin played a a killer, a a, a guy who who was he was played an awful character actually. Yeah. He, murdered petite women. It was just awful. 
And he was just so good at it, because Griffin's just so awesome. Um, but the interrogation scene is actually the one that's in the, um, the archives at the uh, Museum of Television. That, to archive our show, they use that interrogation oh, that's great. between Griffin and I. Such a nice guy, and they, they always play these characters on the things where they rape people. Yeah. Or, you know. yeah. How different is your approach to performing on stage as opposed to performing for the camera? Like when you did Clive, because you hadn't done a play in a while. Mm. Was it different to adjust? You know, I wish I could say it was a lot different. I mean, you just have to make sure that I, I, I you have to make sure that your voice is there. Um, as far as the work, it's the same to me. I did the same acting work that I would do in films I did on stage. The only difference was is I, the volume of your voice has to be bigger and fuller, and you can't just scream that because you'll lose your voice after the second performance. So there's this thing called the Alexander Technique, which is uh, very good for movement and, and speech that, uh, um, that is always good for a film actor to study and practice while they're doing a play. Okay. And to keep practicing it and doing the exercises from the Alexander Technique through the play. And I mean, I, that's, uh, like I said, I'm not a stage actor, so you're talking to a film actor. That's the only difference there was for me. I mean, when I watch a great stage actor perform, it looks very different from when I do in film. But, so, I'm not the right person to ask about that, but as far as it being personal, the only thing I do different is change my volume of my voice. I get my voice to a volume where I'm not screaming, I can be intimate, I can be casual, I can be anything I want to be, but just at a bigger volume so that everybody in the last row can, can hear it. Beautiful. Working such long hours on a long-running show, Criminal Intent, what were some of the things you would do to take care of yourself? Because you have like 19-hour days, right? Yeah, but I stopped taking care of myself after like four years. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. I just said, fuck it. <laughs> How did you prepare for your role in Happy Accident? Um, Director Brad Anderson's awesome, and Marissa Tomei is like one of the best actresses that America ever made. Um, I just want to say that. Um, so this guy was supposed to be, you know, these silly things I have to talk about, but this guy was supposed to be a time traveler. He was put on this earth to come back because he fell in love with this woman that was in a photo that was transfixed in time. He found this photo, and he fell in love with her. And there's this twist at the end. So everything in the, everything, he was from the future, so everything that he, everything was synthetic and nothing was real anymore, which is where we're going anyway. And so the, it was kind of really well written by Brad. So when the guy would walk down the street and he would see a flower, he would, remember that this was not synthetic and that he it would actually have this thing called a scent that he had heard of. And he would go to the flower and smell it and experience it for the first time. So can you imagine experiencing a flower for the first time? I mean, when is the last time anybody here has actually sniffed a flower? There's probably some of us, I would imagine. I would say most likely women between 30 and 40, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe a little older, you know. I would say if you're a guy, I doubt it unless you're, you know, are into gardens, you know. Um, so if you're an actor and, and, and you're a little nutty like me, you go then and you experience that in the most fullest way you can. Things like that. So I wanted to, like for instance, um, I hadn't done that in a long time. It was in the script and I simply hadn't 
put my nose against a flower, you know. So I went to the botanical gardens, and I did, I know this is going to sound weird unless you're a method actor, but I, I sat there on a bench near the botanical, or near these roses and other flowers, and I did a relaxation where I was able to let everything go of that day. Everything that happened to me that day and that was happening to me five minutes up to this point sitting on the bench in this park. And just clear my mind and think of nothing but something sweet. Something that I had, that happened to me that I recall. Something that happened more than seven years ago so that emotion could never change in me. It will always be there. That's the one thing that's across for recent future things. If you're going to deal with centuries, you should always be seven or more years. Because if you use things that happened yesterday, you, you might be out on stage one day and your opinion's going to change. But if it's seven or more years, most likely that event and that piece of fabric that was in that event and that, that something that you're working with, um, your opinion will never change in it. So I went to an event that happened to my life when I was a kid. And I sat there and I, um, I did a relaxation from my toes to the top of my head and I was completely relaxed and then I started to move into that place. And I recreated the room that I was in and um, what I looked like, my hair, the clothes that I was wearing, my mother's uh, room, her dresser, the window open, was there a breeze coming through the window or not? And I, I was able to put myself in that place. And then I just simply opened my eyes. And I went over to the flower. And I smelled it. And so it's a combination of being in that place that I had put myself in and the fact that I hadn't smelled a flower in so long, that when I smelled it, it's completely taken over my life. And this huge smile came over my face. And like this sense of like, I felt like, you know, Keanu Reeves, like, yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, like, wow, you know. <laughs> and, and, and so it was like it was that kind of feeling. That's the kind of main thing that I used was the sky, that everything was like a sensation for the first time. Out of all the roles you played, do you have a favorite? Yes. I mean, it's always going to be the part of Full Metal Jacket. And it's not for romantic reasons. It's, it's not because, oh, you know, I enjoyed playing that part so much or anything. It was just because if Stanley hadn't cast me in that movie, I, I mean, I haven't stopped working since he cast me. And so... How could I not? How could that not be my favorite part? Yeah. My final question is: What is the best bit of advice you were given that you live by today? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I know what it is. When it comes to artists, we all have one thing in common, and that is, is that we want to execute our art, and we want it to be received. And we, if, if it hasn't been received yet, we have no examples of that, of what it's like for the execution of my art to be received. So we try, our natural instinct is then to emulate others, to be like other artists. It's a natural instinct. It's not something that, it's the most intelligent people try to do it. But that's not the correct way to go. The correct thing to do is to trust that eventually what comes from you, not what comes from you trying to be somebody else, 
for something else. But what comes from you eventually will be received. And that because it's coming from you, and it's not anything else or anybody else, it will be received in a completely original way. And you will be remembered because of your uniqueness. You're uniquely you and not anybody else. So to all you actors out there, remember that the key is always comes from yourself. Never pretend. Never try to emulate other performances. Always remember that you are you. You put yourself in the circumstance of the character. You never pretend to be the character, ever. You put things on top of that, physical things, voices, but it's always coming, coming from you. And that will shine the most bright. Because when you go to, into an audition, if you're not trying to emulate somebody else, you will be remembered. If you are totally you, you will be remembered. Doesn't matter if you go up on your dialogue, if you don't do the scene correctly, if there is one moment in your performance where you are totally you and get the story correctly, you will be remembered. And every unique artist in our lives, one does not remind you of the other one. There's a reason for that because of what I just said. And that was given to me when I was young. That was given to me when I was 18 by, uh, by Sharon. And so I pass it to you guys. Well, I thank you very much for tonight. I thank you so much for sitting with me. Vincent, thank you. Let's hear it. Vincent D'Onofrio.